go. Hey y'all, I'm James Wright, and welcome back to uh, Wood by Wright. Wow, that was a mental deficiency. <laughs> so, uh, Wood by Wright Live. Or just another Tuesday. Tuesday. What's that? Just another Tuesday. Yeah, just another Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be doing a live Q&A tonight, so if you have any questions mm -hmm. when you're live, go ahead and put them in the live chat, and my wife will be curating those. Um, if you are watching this recorded, <laughs> then um, go down to the description down below. I'm going to be putting all of the questions down there, and you can read through that, and I'm going to put a timestamp beside them so you can get oh. fairly close to it in the viewing. So if you don't want to watch the whole thing, you can go down through the questions and see if you want to find out what those answers are. So I hope that helps you out. If it does, um, you know. A um, couple things coming up. Um, I'm starting planning now for the next um, the next end of the TCA meeting, so Midwest Tool Collectors Association meeting. Uh, it's going to be in Springfield, Missouri. It's about an eight-hour drive for me. Oh, um, hang on. Will be... Time out. What's that? Uh, you're not coming in very well. My microphone's not coming in? Let me check on this. Oh, it would help if I turned it on. There's a, there's a button on the top here that says on and off. So hopefully that's a little bit better. And I'm going to just check and make sure. Hey, there we go. We got audio signal. <laughs> So, welcome back to the shop. Let's try this again. <laughs> no matter how many times I hit the checklist, there's always one more thing to put on there. So now I need to write on there, make sure microphone is turned on, not just the receiver. Um, Testing okay. the lip reading skills. So we are going to the MWTCA um, national meet. Uh, the last one was in Peoria, Illinois, and the next one is going to be in Springfield, Missouri. Um, so that is going to be the end of September. I want to say September 25th, 26th, something like that. Uh, I've left a link to it down below in the description so you can go and see that. Uh, I will be at that meet, and I've had a few people asking me. That is uh, the last big national meet of this year, and then the next one will be next June in Green Bay, Wisconsin. So, hey, you want to go to Green Bay with me? <laughs> um, so yeah, maybe we'll do like a little Branson trip on that. I was going to say... Good to know that they're doing something in St. Louis that you knew as St. soon Louis? as I knew. No, that's not what you St. just Louis. said. St. Louis. Springfield. I didn't say. Did I say St. Louis? I thought you said St. Louis. Springfield, Missouri. Ah. No, closer to Branson. Um, Apparently, we're taking a weekend trip. <laughs> so, if any of you are going to be there, I am looking forward to hanging out with you. Um, yeah. Uh, see if there's anything else going on. Nothing really. Um, other than if you follow my other channel with uh, Wizards Unite, we are uh, Wizards Unite. We'll be doing a, the meet uh, there, so uh, that'll be fun. Uh, the, what is it? The Fan Fest. Yes, um, <laughs> it'd be fun to meet a woodworker at a, uh, um, a Wizards Unite to uh, um, get together. So yeah. Oh, pff, missing anything else before we go? I don't know. You keep giving me all sorts of things I didn't know about. <laughs> Cool. Um, so, do we have any questions yet? Yes. Okay, Lord, then let's jump into questions. I like this name. Lord Celtic Frost As how much uh, do all the beautiful tools behind you cost? They are priceless because they belong to me and I like them. Um, I Well, it was over a year into hand tool woodworking before I had spent a thousand dollars on all my tools. Um, and with that selection, I was able to do just about everything. Uh, the tools I have here on the wall, mm, let's see. Question is, is it with the exception utility? of the Veritas custom plane, if I were to take that out and the Bearcat dovetail saw, and the Blackburn, if I take those three tools out, so the, the Blackburn frame saw, the dovetail saw, and the custom plane, everything here has probably cost me less than $1,500. Um, which that's sounds like a lot up front, but in comparison to the average wood shop, uh, that's pretty cheap. Um, and so like the, the custom plane, though, that alone is over $400. The um, Bearcat dovetail saw is what 270 bucks. Uh, I think he charged more than that now, and I think it was uh, what 150 on the frame saw. Um, but most everything else here was um, much cheaper than that. 
So give you a little idea. Um, in all honesty, I got started with hand tool woodworking for $12. Um, I bought a, a cheap plastic crosscut saw at uh, Menards, and I, it was a, like a $6 saw, and it had a $6 mail-in rebate, so it was free. I bought a, a $7 set of chisels from Harbor Freight, and then I bought a hand plane, um, a hand plane for $5, and I restored the hand plane. And so all told, I had $12 into the shop. Um, I spent more than that. I spent $25 on my first sharpening stone. It was a two-sided whetstone. Um, but I started woodworking with just that. <laughs> and everything else goes from there. That's really all you need is a chisel. A, well, you need a mallet, but you can make any stick into a mallet. Uh, a chisel, a plane, and a saw, and you can do anything. So, yeah. What else we got? Um, let's see. Tim Or asks, what's your opinion on electrocuted wood using high voltage electricity to burn its path in wood? That looks really cool. Um, there's a lot of fun. Uh, fun. Uh, I actually have a, a a small cabinet that I'm thinking about doing that with. I want to do some uh, some carving, um, and the idea is I want to carve. Um, uh, I want to carve a, a figure with a wand, and then shooting out of the wand, there's a lightning bolt coming out of the end of the wand. So I thought that'd be kind of fun to, to play with. Um, but no, I haven't actually. I haven't played with that, but I have seen. Um, I've seen a lot of it done, and it looks cool. I, you know, I hear a lot of people who complain about any particular methodology. Like, there's a lot of complaining going on about all the epoxy in woodworking. I, I really don't have any problem with that. I, I do whatever you want to do. If you want to make your own woodworking in your own way, go for it. And it doesn't matter what other people think. If you like it, then that's awesome. Um, and so if you hear a lot of people complaining about epoxy in woodworking or electric, uh, the, 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 the bolt work and... and, and there's a specific term for that. I can't remember what it is. But if you find hear people complaining about it and you want to do it, then go ahead and do it. And don't don't worry about what other people think. So, um, Alan. Alan needs his dad joke. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we got a dad joke. So here's the the dad joke book. And let's see. Um, where were we at? Oh, there we are. Why do barbers make good drivers? They know all the shortcuts. Oh, come on. That was a good one. <laughs> so thank you, Alan. And uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm now, if there's a good dad joke for the build I'm working on, I put it at the end of the video. And if there isn't really a really good one, then I, I pull one out of this book, which, uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a good purchase. Thank you for letting me buy that paper. <laughs> I think I pretty much told you to buy it, unfortunately. Yeah. What else we got? Um... Earl? No, yeah. Oh, before I go on, Earl. Alan, I'm probably going to be doing, I'm thinking about next week for the live video doing uh, uh, doing a panel. Um, so doing raised panel, but doing the, the recessed rim raised, raised panel as opposed to doing a pillowed raised panel. So uh, stay tuned for that. Some interesting ideas. So thanks for that. Okay. You've been bugging me to do it for probably a year now. <laughs> Sorry, what you got? He's persistent. Anyways. Earl Soldier asks, what is the advantage to using a number five plane versus a number seven plane for a scrub plane? Um, the number five is far better for a scrub plane. The number seven is just, it's so big and so heavy that ah, that's, that's a lot. Um, a number five is actually, uh, it's, it's a bit on the large side for a scrub plane because a scrub plane is something that it moves very quickly across the wood. You're not really worrying about it. You're just running it across the wood. And if it's heavy, it's going to slow you down. It's going to give you a massive arm workout. So number seven would just be a lot of work on that. Um, an original scrub plane is actually almost about the same length as a number four. Grab the four out. So, I mean, the number four is a little bit shorter than the, than the scrub plane. Um, but it's much narrower, and so hey, that narrow frame really works well. If you're going to turn a plane into a scrub plane, uh, the one I would do the most is the five and a quarter. Um, and the five and a quarter is much thinner than the five. It's also much shorter than the five. And this would actually make a really good scrub plane, but the problem is they often cost a bit more, and so why are you turning a, an expensive plane into a scrub plane? Um, but yeah, I would not turn a seven into a scrub plane. It's it's very big, it's very heavy, it's very bulky. It's also wider, so it just isn't going to make a very good iron in there. But yeah, number uh, uh, where are we? number five makes a very good scrub plane. Because this is my 
the scrub plane that I made and used quite a bit. Although recently I've been using the actual scrub plane, um, the, the Stanley uh, 41. And I, I like having a little bit thinner frame on there. It, it makes it a little bit faster. So, yeah. Food for thought. Don't use a 7. Not good. <laughs> what else we got? Let's see. Brian Ross. Hi, James. Where? I think they meant what is your favorite tool you have made and which one do you use the most? Mm, that is a hard question. What is my favorite child um, of tools that I have made myself? Um, my spoke shave, I use that quite a bit. My mallet, okay, yeah, my mallet. Uh, where's my first mallet? It's around here somewhere, I set it down. Well, here's my carving mallet, and my finishing mallet. Um, one of the very first tools I ever made was a mallet, and I use that thing every day. Um, a phenomenal tool that I just, uh, I'd, I'd be lost without. Um, so a mallet is probably the top of that list. Um, Dovetail chisel. I really love how the dovetail chisel came out. Absolutely gorgeous. And I use that one quite a bit. Uh, the, the frame saw. Ooh, frame saw is a really good one. And I use that thing all the time. Anytime I have a really big rip cut to make, the frame saw comes in. It's so handy. Um, yeah, this is, there's a lot of things that I've made, but I think the, the mallet is the most common thing I've used. The frame saw is one of my favorites. Uh, that thing is just a lot of fun to play with. So. Hope that answers your Where question. Your Bearcat dovetail saw? I didn't make it. Oh. It was made by Bearcat. But it's one of your favorites. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's it's absolutely gorgeous. I mean, this is this thing is just beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Happy. Although I'm probably going to be, I, I want to make a new carcass saw. I might make a car carcass saw and a tenon saw. Um, so stay tuned for that. And those may become the tools that I use more than anything else. So, yeah. What else we got? Oh, and for those asking uh, about my mom, um, she is doing much better. Um, still recovering. There's a long road, heart, open heart surgery. Um, you know, that, that takes a while to recover from. But uh, doing much, much better now. So she's up and, up and around now. And I think she's even driving. So, yeah. Yes. Maybe like, we'll have her in here for a carving video. Well, we eventually, when she's doing better, have to do yeah, our... Yeah, and she's not on blood thinners and carbon. slicing... Yeah, yeah, off. yeah, not... <laughs> <laughs> There's blood everywhere! It'd make for a good live video. <laughs> I'm surprised she's not on commenting right now. <laughs> oh. What else we got? Besides oh. the jokes. Oh, no, there there was a, a question in... I don't usually let other questions jump to the top, but this one made me chuckle. <laughs> What's that? Because I wanted to know your answer versus my answer. Tim Johnson asks, what skill are you trying to improve? <laughs> the, the greatest skill I will ever work on is getting to know my wife better. <laughs> it is something that will take the rest of my life and is always changing. It's like trying to shoot a bird out of the sky it's always moving around and you think you got it and it takes off and it's over there now. Um, except for the bird is invisible and you're trying to use a bent up BB gun. Um, it, it, yeah, that's, that's what uh, it's kind of like. Okay, you started well, you ended <laughs> not so much. <laughs> I'm sorry. But, but as, you... as to skills of woodworking, um, carving, is one that I'm always playing with and is probably a skill that I will work on for the rest of my life and always find something new about. Mm. Um, it is a very, I, carving is the, is the very basic skill. Um, every, everything in the shop is carving. It's just every other tool is a jig for the carving. A plane is just a way to make sure that the carving chisel doesn't go too deep. Um, Freehand carving is just one of those, it's an incredibly freeing thing because you can do whatever you want in whatever way you want, and yeah, it's really enjoyable. So, yeah, that's probably where it'll be. <laughs> Sorry, there are comments. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <coughs> um. <laughs> Sorry. I kind of threw you under the bus with that question right now, though, too. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Steve Wenner asked, 
finally in my shop now, starting on a tool wall behind my bench. Do you have any recommendations or things I should consider? Look, consider looking to do French cleat system. Okay, um, I actually have an entire um, series doing my tool wall. So if you want to see that, go and look at that. Uh, I think there's, what is it? I have a, a playlist called Shop Renovation or something of that nature, where I've gone through rebuilding the bench and switching everything around my shop and figuring out where I want all my tools. Um, and I'm probably going to do a video here soon about the tool wall and how I have it set up. Um, is there anything particular I would change on this? And there's a few things I think I would work on to do a little bit better, um, but not much. I, I mean, the, the nice thing about a tool wall is when I'm standing here working, and I'm always working at this spot, everything is within reach. And most of my common tools, I don't even have to lift my feet up. Any other tool in the shop is just one step away, and I can touch any tool I have in the shop with one step. And so the nice thing about having a tool wall is everything is out there and open and quick and easy. The problem with it is, is everything gets dusty because it's open, and if someone were to sneak in here, nothing's locked up. Um, and so that's the nice thing about having a tool chest is you can kind of protect them a little bit better, especially if you're in a rusty environment, being able to close something up um, and mitigate the temperature and moisture inside um, is nice. But yeah. So yeah, definitely take a look at that list. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of videos on, well, all of this. I have a video on each of these racks as well as the French cleat system. French cleats by hand are a little bit tricky. You ready? Yep. Um, Dennis Haynes asked, what is the best tool for making designs on the four sides of a picture frame? The best tool for making designs on the four sides of a picture frame. Uh, I don't know, if you're talking about like shaping the molding, um, the best thing to do is actually to shape it in a long stick, make the molding you want, and then cut all the angles out of it and fold the whole thing up into a frame. Um, and for that, I mean, if you want one tool, the Stanley 55 or 45 will do all of the moldings you want and any shape on that. Um, outside of that, it really depends on what you want in the frame because everyone has a different idea and, and um, there, there's just so many ways to do it that it's different. Um, yeah, now if you're talking about actually doing the frame when it's all together, so you glue together the sides and then you want to do the molding, then the easiest thing is actually carving. Because um, if you're working on the inside angle of it, getting a plane in there is almost impossible. Uh, but you can you can rel relatively easily do um, freehand carving in there, which is actually a video I'd like to do sometime. Because I've got a couple of things I'd like to frame, like that uh, silver play button. Maybe you should do a carved frame around that. That'd be fun. Hope that answers your question. Probably didn't. <laughs> All right, we got lots of questions. Okay, what do we got? Benjamin Siemens asked. Uh, hi, how is a jointer like my number eight set up differently from a scrub or smoothing plane? Well, um, that depends on what you want to do with it. Um, because the, the big difference between smoothing plane and scrub plane is the depth that the blade is cutting out. Now there's also the, the mouth opening and chip breaker and a bunch of other settings in there. Uh, but the biggest thing is how far does the iron stick out? And when you're working with a jointer, uh, the way a jointer works is it can touch the wood here and touch the wood here. And if there's a valley in between, then the mouth won't cut because it's sitting on the high point and the high point there. Well, if you stick the blade down farther, then it will still cut in that valley in between. And so the shallower your cut is, the flatter you can make the board. So a lot of people then want to make a really, really shallow, shallow cut with a thousandth of an inch slide from end to end and you'll get this perfectly flat smooth surface uh, but the problem is a thousandth of an inch takes a long time to get through those valleys um, and so usually what I end up doing with my jointer um, is I, I, I make it a, a mild cut so it's not quite as heavy it, it's nowhere near as heavy as a scrub plane um, it's a, usually taking off you know a hundredth of an inch so it's, it's a fairly heavy cut it's not a smoothing cut but it's it's, it's solid um, and I will, I'll bring the board into flat with that. And then I'm going to back the iron off and do a detailed cut with two, th two or three thousandths of an inch um, and, and joint it out with that. And so I'll do a, a couple finishing slides with that. And that will bring everything else nice and smooth. And so I'm, I'm usually not worrying about 
uh, the chip breaker and the mouth on this because I'm not doing a smooth cutting. Usually when you're jointing, you're gonna be gluing things together. So any roughness on the surface is not a huge issue. Um, if that is an issue and I want to make them perfectly smooth, I don't set up this uh, jointer as a smoother. What I'll do is I'll bring it nice and flat and then I'll bring my smoothing plane in and I'll take my smoothing plane and I'll smooth the surface off. Um, and I'll let the smoothing plane do the smoothing work and let the jointer do the jointing work. Um, so I don't generally set it up with a really fine mouth. But uh, yeah, hope that answers your question. Bye. Uh, Voliner's Workshop. Hey James, you mentioned when I posted my dice box stuff that you were into D&D. &D. Um, do you still play and have you ever thought of making some dice for a project? I have not played um, any RPG games in two or three years um, because they end up getting very addictive and I, I get into them wholeheartedly. Um, he doesn't need another hobby right now. <laughs> no, I've got too many hobbies. Um, so yeah, no, I have wanted to make some dice. I've wanted to do, to do some carving of uh, you know, a, a D20, D15. D D15, why did I say that? D10. Um, and that is actually one of the first projects that I wanted to do once I finished the bench. And I set up a jig to make the dice and I never did it. Um, so yeah, maybe I should do that. <laughs> um, it, it, it's, it's actually a really fun thing to try and get 20 sides of a dice that are exactly the same size so that there's an even chance of it landing on any side. Um, be, uh, be a fun time. Plus carving little tiny numbers in each one. Yeah. So we'll see. Someday in the future. All right. Blue Kestrel asked, any tips on making a picture frame for my big wedding picture? <laughs> Such as type of wood, joints, tools involved, etc. Uh, type of wood, do not, type of wood does not matter. Um, especially for a picture frame it's not a structural thing it will it will work for whatever you want so pick the wood that you want to work with pick the wood that you like a color or your wife yes it's a, it's a wedding picture your wife has, has preeminence in whatever that i shouldn't assume blue cholesterol's male <laughs> um well on the wood by right channel it's what 97 percent male so. i just i <laughs> there are a few women in this channel that i really do like um, it's it, it is always nice when I when I get a woman who has who has a question about something. It's like yes, go get them. Um, I'd love to see. I mean, there's like Anne of All Trades who does um, a lot of woodworking. Um, she does a lot of hand tool woodworking. I'd like to see other women in the in the, the field. I don't get enough of that. Maybe I should make a bench for my wife. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, what was the question? Picture frame. Yes. Uh, wood type does not matter. Um, use whatever you want. Just make sure you turn off your phone's ringer. <laughs> um, the the joint particularly um, I'm a dude okay <laughs> you know uh, just a, a simple miter joint is is all you need for any for most things you know a miter joint with a spline and it, it's completely solid if you want to get into more there are a lot of other difficult um, joinery methods but a miter joint with a spline works phenomenally it's quick it's easy and it goes together really well. Um, I have several videos on doing mitered spline joints. I have a couple of lives where I go into detail with it. Um, and then if you want to, s no, I don't have that here. Um, I have a, a series on the joinery window, which I did, um, what, six months ago, something like that, uh, where I went through a bunch of different joints on the joinery window. And so if you want to look through there and find a joint that looks good to you, um, for a picture frame, the joinery really is not, is not a big deal. So go with something that you, you are comfortable with doing and go with something that uh, looks good in the, the finished product. So, yeah, hope that helps. Okay. I'm not sure how much I like Voliner's workshop anymore. <laughs> what do you say? Because Alan's been rubbing off on some others. <laughs> and apparently I can play a halfling without having to pretend. <laughs> <laughs> She's travel size, for my convenience. I just have a fear of heights. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, well, moving on. Who had a question? Everybody has a question. Roy, Roy G, how can you make a heart box? Question mark. Clamps? Question mark. Or direct carving? Question mark. Um, I'm guessing you're talking about like a bandsaw box with that's shaped like a heart. 
Um, the easiest way is honestly just to carve it. Um, you know, cut the cut the heart shape, slice it in half, make the well not in half, but you know, a lid thickness and a main body thickness, and then carve it out. Um, just use your uh, use a, uh, a brace and bit and drill out most of the material, then come into the chisel and, and chop it all to shape. Um, it, it sounds like a lot of work, but it's really not. It's a, it's a fairly quick project. Um, who? Uh, oh, come on. Oh, there was another channel who just did a video on that. Um, he's a, he's a, a fan of the, of the channel. He may even be on here live. Um, was oh, it on it's the killing me. Line? I, no, I, I, I met with him at the Peach Meet in January. Oh. Um, he drove me around for that. Oh, that's killing me. I can't remember his name. I'll remember it in a while. But yeah, maybe I should do that sometime. That'd make a good video. What else we got? Well, apparently Alan is the troublemaker name. Well, yeah, of course he is. Uh, no, there's two of them. Oh, there's two Alans? Volners and Alan. Oh, they're teaming up? They're, yes. The Alan Square team. Anyways. Uh, we answered Rory's question. Earl Soldier, do you have any advice on how to make a new knob for an old plane if I don't have a lathe? I was going to try to whittle one unless you know a better way. Thank you. Um, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be making a knob next week, and I'm toying with the idea of doing an octagonal knob. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to talk, because I'm actually making it for a friend and it's on here. He um, sent me this uh, Stanley number 10 and a quarter, uh, which is an incredibly rare plane and really, really cool. Uh, but the nice thing about this is the knob and tote on it, actually, um, they'll lean to the side. And so what that does is when you actually get up tight against something because it's a rabbit plane, it, it makes it so that you can still have access at the handle. So both the, ha both the knob and the tote will rotate side to side. Um, so we're making a new one for that because he doesn't have the uh, it doesn't have the tote for it that didn't come with it, but uh, we're going to make a knob and tote that match um, out of zebra wood. So that is what I'm, I'm getting together for that. So that should be really cool. Um, but that being said, uh, I mean you can you can make a knob any way you want as long as it's comfortable to you. I, I really want to try and make an octagonal knob and literally carve it into shape. Um, and what you do is you make a pattern of the shape you want and you carve one surface to that pattern, set the pattern on and make sure it fits and then you flip it 180 degrees and do it on the other side and then you flip it 90 degrees and you do it on the other side you flip it 180 degrees and then you've got a square with that pattern and then you flip it 45 degrees and you do that and you start taking off the corners until it matches that profile and so you have this card that is your profile shape that gives you the exact profile that you're looking on all your sides. Um, and so that you can make it an octagon fairly easily. And then if you want to make it round, then you just make it a 16-a-gon, whatever that is, taking all the corners off. And then you make it a 32-a-gon. And you take all those corners off. Um, and eventually you get so close to round that if you just take a, a file or a rasp to it, it just rounds it off nicely and you're, you're at round. Um, so no, you do not need a lathe. Um, though making a spring pole lathe is, is relatively quick. Um, I have about eight or ten hours into the one I made. Which, if you want to see that, look it up on uh, spring pole lathe. Which is one. Of, what, the other thing, if he if he doesn't want the octagonal handle, I'm going to do it on a spring pole lathe. But I might actually show doing both because I have enough piece for that. So yeah. Sorry, talking too long. What else we got? Uh, let's see. Tim or S, have you ever made any musical instruments? Um, no, I haven't. I haven't made a single musical instrument. One of these years, I'm going to make a guitar. I want to make a 12-string a acoustic guitar. Um, not to play it, but just to make it. It looks like a really fun instrument. There's a lot of fun skills involved in that. Um, I made a whistle. Does the whistle count? Whistle right here? Whistle? Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, look, a squirrel! <laughs> I might make a flute. Flute would be fun. Um, I, I am not as much of a musician, so, yeah, it's not as high on my list, but 
I, I do <laughs> want to do some. <laughs> Sorry. B Power said, my math teacher wife is twitching with your agons. <laughs> with, uh, yes. <laughs> 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 oh, uh, we're probably not going to be getting to everyone's question. Um, if we have too many, um, I'm sorry. Uh, but if you really want to bump them to the top of the list, then a super chat does that. Or make it really interesting, then Sarah will. Yeah, make it make Sarah laugh, and then, <laughs> and then she'll put it up there. Okay, I have to <laughs> quite the musical you are. Um, let's see. Who's I can play one note on my one wind note whistle. Carlos Alberto asked, any tips on how to remove surface rust from hand planes? Um, <laughs> I have a lot of videos on hand plane restoration, so definitely check those out. Um, different types of rust require different uh, things on it. Usually, if it's just surface rust on the outside, I'm just going to take a really fine grit sandpaper and smooth it off, and we're good to go. Um, <coughs> sorry. Gotta have a microphone right there. Um, if the rust is really deep, I might put it in a, uh, a bath, either in like a vinegar or a vapor rust. And there's a, a different rusts I will put in different types of baths. I do also have um, I have an electrolysis bucket. Um, I've used that a few times. Um, and then if it's really bad and I want to take everything down, then I'll take it to the sandblaster and grind it all off. Um, and Every method out there, you're going to have people that absolutely hate that method and think that it is the devil's work and you should never do it. And then you'll have other things that are like, this is the only way to do it. And there are so many different ways of doing it. And every, there are different types of rust and, and different amounts of it that um, there are different ways of doing it. Um, you, there is no one good way. But definitely take a look at the restoration videos. I actually have one series where I take um, three different planes and three different conditions and I go through them and address them in different ways. Um, so I hope that helps. What else we got? I'm hanging. I'm hanging. Uh, let's see. Troy Jacobson asks, got a nice hand-powered hand grinder in a $1 box. It needs a good cleaning, though. Lots of grime, kind of greasy. It would be good to clean it off. Not too rusty, though. Um. Soap and water cleans grease off really nicely. Um, or a degreaser takes grease off. <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of people really get worried about cleaning tools off. And there are tools that were taken out of a working condition or were stored. And really all they need is a wipe off and you're good to go. I mean, my, my number eight, six and five, uh, um, the five and a half, um, those three, they've got, they, when I got them, they had a bit of rust on them and they were really dusty and they'd been sitting in a barn. Um, but with a good cleaning, literally some soap and water and wiping them down, cleaning them off, oiling them up, they're good to go. Um, I, I haven't, you know, I haven't painted them or shined them up at all. They're in the same condition they were the last time they were used. Um, so yeah, um, that would be my, my top thing is soap and water and use it. It doesn't need to be pretty unless you really want it to be pretty. <laughs> you ready? Yeah, yeah. All right, David I stopped talking. Aaron's asks, what would you consider a basic set of leather working tools for a woodworker? Parentheses, making tool holders, straps, and other things to add to my woodworking projects. Um, a stitching punch um, is this is the big thing because you're going to be doing a lot of stitching. Um, like for my, my tool rolls, um, a stitching punch was the, was the, was the key thing. Especially, um, I used, if you really get into the leather working world, they are going to hate you if you use a stitching punch that uses round holes because round holes can introduce um, stress points. And so the ones they actually have are diamond cutter. And so they cut a little diamond shape instead of a round hole. In all honesty, who cares? <laughs> um, there, there's really not that big of a difference for, for general use, and now, unless you really want to get into it and get perfectionistic. Um, uh, the, the stitching punch, which is stitching punch has um, three, four, five punches all in a row, and so they're evenly spaced. And so you can overlap one hole and make sure that your 
um, your, your holes are always evenly, and so your, your stitches go through them easier. Um, the next thing would be a, a rivet punch. Um, so depending upon the size of rivet you have is the punch for that. And then a bucking block and hammer for putting in rivets. Um, and with those things, you can do 90% of your leather work. Um, you don't need a lot more than that. Now, unless you want to get into leather carving or the detail work or burnishing edges and, and things like that, then you're, you're going to go down another rabbit hole really quickly. Because leather working is the type of thing where you get you know, a half dozen tools to do your first project, and then your second project requires three dozen more tools. Um, the next project after that is like another seven, do seven dozen tools. And uh, you're still not anywhere near how many you really need. Sounds like other hobbies I have. Hmm what you really need yeah you're all i really need babe mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. what other questions we got yeah <laughs> uh, i always like how everyone thinks that you're afraid to tell me how much you actually spend on tools because they don't know the rule in our house <laughs> yeah if i spend it she can too equal <laughs> amounts <laughs> Uh, let's see. Co Fire, KO Fire 66 asks, how many hand planes do you have? Uh, we actually did this as a question not too long ago and it ended up with 88 hand planes. However, I just had a garage sale and I sold probably 25 or 30 of them. So I probably got really? rid of about half my hand planes. Yeah. There were a whole pile that I've been wanting to restore for a long time and just never got around to it. Um, so I still have, I mean, I still have quite a few, but uh, I, I don't have as many as I used to. We got rid of a lot. <laughs> and we, I, I put out the garage sale and the very first person who showed up bought $135 worth of hand tools and, and took probably about a third of everything I yeah, had. Yeah, it was kind of nice. First customer of the day. What else we got? All right, let's see. Moonwolf asks, what was the biggest inspiration that got you into woodworking? My father, um, because he he did woodworking for a hobby, and I followed in his footsteps. So, yeah, um, that's, that's the reason I do woodworking. <laughs> that's what my dad did. And so I always followed him. He was out in the garage or in the shop, and, um, yeah, I woodworked right along with him. Now for getting into YouTube and doing hand tool woodworking. Your inspiration was? Um, well, most all of my hobbies that I, and I always have hobbies. Um, I actually had a, a channel called uh, Hobbies Done Right. And I would be, I would, I put up videos of all sorts of different hobbies that I was getting into. Um, because my hobby was shooting videos of my hobby. And so when I decided to get into hand tool woodworking, I bought Oh, here, here, there, I got right over here. I was at a garage sale and I picked up this hand plane right here. And if you go back and look at my first video, um, it was me bringing this home and being like, hey, I just bought this hand plane and I'm going to restore it. And so my um, getting into hand planes, uh, getting into hand tools was just, it was natural for me to shoot a video of it, to document it for myself. Uh, the difference with hand tools as opposed to other videos is that other people soon start watching it and it, rather than just being a channel about um, stuff that I'm doing for my own sake, it ended up being a channel about stuff that I'm doing for everyone else's sake. <laughs> so yeah, this is the hand plane that started the whole thing right there. Bought it for five bucks at a garage sale and it was badly rusted and uh, now it's there. So yeah, still works pretty well. Just has a, a few quirks to it. She's smiling. I'm always smiling. <laughs> what else we got? Did my nose get a little bigger? <laughs> um, let's see. Darwin. What? I don't even know if I'm going to say this pronouncedly. The goo? Yeah, I probably said that wrong. Anyways, hi, James. Do I have to sharpen the side of my the side of the blade of my skew rabbit plane because I get a tear out in the shoulder even if I use the knicker when doing rabbit. There is a, a long debate about the side of a side rabbit plane. 
the problem with sharpening the side of it is that if you sharpen it, you're taking off a bit of, bit of material. And if you keep sharpening it off, that side is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller, and it's never going to be enough to then reach all the way to the side. Um, my thing is that that side doesn't have to be sharp, um, but it, it shouldn't be dull and flappy. Um, and so if, if it needs work, I'm going to sharpen it once, and then I'm not going to touch it again as long as I don't ding it or nick it or, or do something else to it. Um, and so no, it's not something that has to be razor sharp. Um, the, most of the time, the problem with the side being fuzzy, um, well, depending upon what you're doing, it, the, the, the issue with it being fuzzy is that either the knicker isn't actually slicing fibers. Uh, well, okay, that, okay, let's back up. If you're going cross grain and your cutting is a dado, um, the, 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 the spur has got to be really sharp and, and set correctly so you're actually slicing all the fibers before the plane gets there. Um, the other problem is that sometimes the spur has been sharpened down and the spur is actually inside the side face of the wall. And so what that means is your, your cut will progressively move over this way. And so that will give you a fuzzy edge as well. Um, so you need to make sure that the spur is flush with the side. You don't want it sticking out, otherwise it's going to be scraping things. Um, you want it to be just flush with the edge. Um, uh, if you are going with the grain, then generally I don't use the spur. Uh, because going with the grain, um, the spur can actually create new strings and fuzzes. Um, usually my methodology is I'm going to stay away from my line just a couple thousandths of an inch. So when I cut the groove down, I can cut the surface of it. And then I'm going to flip the, the plane on side, and I'm going to take the other surface off. And so I'll just take a couple passes to remove that line back to where it needs to be. That way I get a nice clean sidewall as well as bottom face. Um, it takes a second longer just to roll it up on its side and take one or two passes over to get it back to where it should be. But I, I like doing that. So. Um, I'm beating around the bush on that one. Probably didn't answer your question, but I hope I did. <laughs> All right. SRG asked, I bought a number 26 Stanley, but the depth adjustment isn't engaging with the cap iron because the cur the screw won't seat set in the, in the relief for it. Is there a way to fix this? And is there a part unique to this plane? It was made between 1888 and 1922. Hey, Stanley number 26. So um, this is not a Stanley number 26. This is a, um, this is the, I can't remember what company made this one. I can't quite read the edge on there. Um, but it's very similar. So um, a transitional plane. The it sounds like you actually have the wrong parts in the plane. Um, chip breakers, they made a whole bunch of different ones and different chip breakers from different planes are not interchangeable. Even though they're the same width and same length, the slot for the depth adjuster might be in the wrong place or the hole for the bolt to go through might be in the wrong place. Um, so they're, they are all differently. Uh, they are all different. So you may actually have the wrong chip breaker in there. Um, can you read the, the end of the question again? He's talking about the slot. That the depth adjustment isn't engaging with the cap iron because the screw won't set in the relief for it or seat in the relief for it. Okay, I think I know what you're talking about. Um, so let me turn this on and show you. Oop. Why are you not on? Oh no, why is my camera not working? Uh, shoot. Well, um, basically what you have is you have the iron here has the long slot that the bolt can go through. And then in the cap iron, the main bolt goes through this hole. But the depth adjuster needs to stick through the iron and then into this rectangular hole. And the depth adjuster is what moves it up and down. If that rectangular hole is up too high, then that means the iron is going to be sticking out the bottom of the plane. If that hole is down too low, that means the iron will never get all the way to the mouth opening. Um, and so that's usually the problem. It sounds like what you're having is that the 
the bolt isn't going all the way through the iron and through the the hole opening in the in the cap iron. Um, in which case, then you probably have the wrong uh, the wrong chip breaker where the hole for that is in the wrong place. Although I haven't come across one where that hole is in the wrong place. Um, then you also have the lateral adjuster, which is this lever. Take the handle off; it's getting wrong. This lateral adjuster here moves side to side. Now, that there's a little wheel there. That wheel fits into the long slot of the iron, and so that will actually push against the iron to move it side to side. Um, so if that wheel doesn't fit into the slot of the iron, then it means you have the wrong iron for your plane. Um, so something to check there, but it, it sounds like you have something in there is wrong and it doesn't match your plane. So if that doesn't answer your question, send me a message, send me an email, and I'll work with you on that. What's next? <coughs> um, Jacob Meadows asks, what is a farrier's buttress used for? A farrier's buttress? I have no idea. Let's say. I don't know what that is. <laughs> There's not a farrier, is it? What? Okay, you don't rec recognize anything by that name. Okay, that's no. all I need to know. A farrier is a uh, someone a who horse. works with horses. Yeah, yeah, that's why I was like, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Anyways, uh, Doug asked, "What would have you not worked with yet, but would really like to?" Oh, um, I would love to work with some of the really hard Australian woods. Um, I think that would be a lot of fun to, to Ooh, play road with. Road trip, road trip. Yeah, we need to go out to Australia just to play with some woods. <laughs> I go. <guess. laughs> um, there are a lot of, of really difficult woods out there that I'd like to actually experiment with and play with and, and try some things out of. Um, other woods that I haven't played with. Um, I haven't done much with Cocobolo. Uh, that, that's a fun one. I've, I've played with it a couple times, but not enough to, to really get to know it that much. Um, I had a lot of people telling me I should play with that. Um, I think it's most things on my list so yeah all right um how about jim eichenberg asked i need to make myself a shooting board i'm very scared of trying to get it square please tell me i'm overthinking it i've been putting it off out of here for far too long yep you're overthinking it <laughs> um uh, whenever you're making a wooden shooting board the the chances are it will probably go out of square at some point in the future and so the way you fix it is you get a shoulder plane or a rabbit plane and you clean up the fence and you take the fence into square with the with the, the groove. And I actually have a video on making uh, my shooting board which I'd like to do another video on making a different style one uh, but this one actually has a groove in the side that the plane will slide in and if the fence gets out of square then you can just take your plane and work on it so if it's if this side here is too far down there, then I'm going to take my plane and I'm going to take a couple passes off here and each time I'm going to take the pass off I'm going to come farther and farther and farther back until I get one pass all the way across. And that way I can then just take my square, set it on the groove, slide it up on there and see where I'm at. Um, and that is how you can adjust them. So don't overthink the actual construction of it because if they are not adjustable, then you may want to redesign it. Um, and the easiest way to adjust a wooden shooting board is just to plane it. It's wood. That's what it's done with. And if it's really, really fine, your micro adjustments can be done with a file. Um, but uh, then you're getting too picky. <laughs> what else? Um, Josie Whale 77 asks, what? are your favorite brand of axes slash hatchets? Um, I actually have not played with many, so I'm not the right person to ask on that. Um, though if I had to be given one right now, um, the I, I'm, I'm probably going to be buying it ads here soon, and I'll be purchasing it from um, Black Bear Forge as long as I can get it in because he has a very long list right now. Um, but Black Bear Forge makes some amazing things and a relatively cheap price for them. Um, so yeah, that's where I would I would probably get mine. Um, but as to you know commonly made hatchets, um, I I haven't played with them enough to be able to answer that. Sorry. What do we got? 
Oh, let's see. Oh, another name I'm not going to get right. Dr. Kaneuchima? I don't know. I've been restoring some hammers and hatchets, but none of my local mills have ash ha yeah, have ash or hickory thicker than seven eighths. I do have red oak and walnut that I milled myself or a block of teak. Any recommendations? Um, one of the best places to get large stock material is go get some firewood. Um, and it works great. And it's also riven, so it's going to be a really nice grain. Um, so you, you know you're getting great straight grain. Um, so that, that is, that's the best place for a hatchet handle. Um, but red oak um, is actually a, a pretty decent hatchet handle. Is it perfect? No. Um, I, I would prefer white oak over red oak, but that's just a personal preference. Um, but red oak is, is, a good, is a good wood for it. So um, yeah, red oak is a good one. Um, then laminating wood together is always an option. Um, a lot of people are really going to poo-poo gluing together uh, three-quarter to make something wide enough. And uh, honestly, if it's done well, no one's ever going to know the difference and it's never going to be a problem. So don't, don't worry about that. Um, I know I'm going to get a lot of hate mail for saying that, but lamination is not an issue. So, yeah. What else we got? All right. I skipped Adam Toth's question. So I got to go back. <laughs> he asks, does... Does color dye in epoxy dye light colored wood? Does color dye in epoxy? What? So like if your epoxy is a different color and you put it on a lighter wood, will it dye it? Um, usually no, because the dye is suspended in the epoxy and the epoxy isn't thin enough to penetrate into the wood. So it, I, I've never come across a situation where the wood leaches the dye out of the epoxy. Um, that's, yeah, I, I, and I can't imagine that ever happening, so not, not a problem. Um, yeah. All right. Back on. If, uh, let me back up to that, though. If you do ever have any worry about that, test it first. Um, anytime you start talking about finishing or coloring, always, always, always test it first. Get a scrap piece of wood, scrap piece of epoxy, put the two together and see what happens. That's the, the best suggestion I can give you. Sorry, what you got? Oh, apparently they said black color was added. Yeah, same thing. Same thing. Okay. Um, so S. Richie clarified his question with the, um, the Stanley 26 depth adjustment. Said the screw for the cap iron isn't seating in the frog properly, preventing the depth, depth adjustment from engaging. The screw from the cap iron isn't seating ah okay so the the screw on the back here the cap iron that actually has to go into the frog on the iron and move around so apparently uh, it sounds like you have the wrong cap iron on there so that the cap iron is putting the screw at a different spot so apparently that screw is running into it or you just have the wrong screw that has too big a head and so the, the head is running into things um, so Option number one is modify your head. Take a file to it and smooth it down and make it smaller so that it works in there. Um, option number two is find the correct cap iron if that's the problem. Um, but those are things that you'd never be able to play because cap irons are never marked. So it's almost impossible to tell if you have the right one or not because the, someone else who knew less probably threw it in there. Um, but yeah, it sounds like you have the wrong cap iron if that isn't working with your frog. Uh, because the, the hole that it fits into and the depth adjustment yoke are all one piece, and so they're, they, they should fit if it's the right frog. What else we got? All right. Uh, let's see. Tim Moore asks, favorite and least favorite wood to use? White oak is favorite. Um, not because it's easy. White oak is very difficult. Um, but it is an absolutely gorgeous wood and it has so much character and there are different ways of doing it in different cuts and the rays and it's, it's a, a fantastic wood to work with because it's just beautiful. It's difficult, but it's well worth it. Least favorite wood to work with? Uh, most pines, uh, they just crush so easily uh, that they're, uh, you have to have everything deadly sharp with a pine 
Um, otherwise, you're going to be running into issues and crushing fibers and, and just they, and, and there's no benefit to them. Uh, they they don't never they never look as sharp as, as a white oak. Um, yeah, although maple maple is a pain to work with and it has no character to it. Um, so it's a painful thing that doesn't give any response and yeah, it's just not worth it. I'm not a huge fan of maple. You can't tell, <laughs> except for like really curly maple then that might be worth it. A lot of Chateauian in there. What else we got? Uh, let's see, Isaac Kern asked, what advice would you give someone starting out woodworking as a small business? Um, that's a hard one because everyone's business is different. Uh, the best advice I can give you is do something you find fun. Because if it's not fun to you, then it's a job. And, and, and who wants a job? If, you, if it becomes a pain, then, then go get a job. You're gonna make more money doing that. Um, do something that you enjoy, and if you aren't enjoying it, then you're doing it wrong. Find a different way to do that. Um, so that's, that's probably the biggest piece of advice I can give you. What else? Oh, not uh, let's see, um, Steve Wenner asked, if you were to add one power tool or two to your shop, what would you pick? Why have or haven't you? Um, well, I do have one power tool that I've added, and I use it occasionally, and it is the Triton 7-inch um, power planer. And this thing is an absolute beast. Um, and the reason why I got this is um, this, will, this will plane um, faster than my hand planes, which sounds ridiculous, but in all honesty, most of the small power planers, um, I can actually do faster work with a scrub plane than I can with a small power planer. That thing is big enough that it will hog through material faster than my scrub planer. Um, and so usually I don't use it for most projects, but for a lot of times when I'm doing a project where I need to um, plane down a lot of surface material, in order to get videos out on time, I pull that out. Um, and I'll pull out a power planer because it, it, it allow me to get through all the material quick enough so that I can actually get videos out. Um, otherwise, I'll be spending an entire week down here in the shop with a hand plane, whereas I could do it in you know eight hours or so with a, with a power plane. But uh, yeah, um, every now and then when I get into some really figured wood, um, an orbital sander would just be really nice. Um, but there isn't that much more. Um, the big dimensioning, occasionally a table saw or circular saw would be nice, but not that often. Yeah. What else? Uh, let's see. Mike Evans asked, any hints for using broad axes or foot, is it adzes? Adz. Adz. Um, biggest hint is don't hit your foot. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I haven't had much experience with that, so I'm not the, not the best person to ask on that. Sorry. Um, yeah, I have, I have a couple ads that need to be sharpened, but I've never actually used them. And I have a broad axe that I need to put a handle on, so, sorry. All right, uh, let's uh, see. We have a couple, we have enough time for one or two more questions, so we're like, two more we're gonna get to. If we haven't answered your question, then feel free to send me an email or throw up a super chat really quickly and uh, we'll get to it. <laughs> uh, let's see. Tra Cruia said top three book recommendations. Book recommendations? I'm sorry, I don't read much. Um, books and magazines are a pain for me um, because my reading speed is so incredibly slow that it is, it is a, a, a poor source of information for me. Um, best source of information I've, I've had is getting to know other people who really know what they're doing and bouncing ideas off of them and learning from them. Um, but as to books, um, anything made, anything published by um, uh, Lost Art Press, um, phenomenal system and it's, it's a press basically dedicated to the ancient arts of, of woodworking. Um, so anything from there is, is well worth it. Um, next, uh, the next thing I would say is uh, Mortis and Tenon Magazine. Um, it, it, it's more or less a, a scientific journal for hand tool woodworking. Um, that is, is definitely worth it. Um, but yeah, sorry, I'm not a, a great resource on that. 
One more question. All right, Aubrey Kuhn asked, um, what specific models or versions or even brands of different tools have you found that you really don't like after trying them and why? Um, that's a hard question. Because I tend to try and enjoy everything I find. Um, I find that enjoyment is less, is less an outcome and more what you put into it. Um, one of my fa father's favorite sayings is that there, are no, there are no boring times, there are only boring people. In other words, if something boring, it's because you're making it boring. Um, so I take the, the same philosophy into all my woodworking is that um, if I don't like something, it's probably because I don't like it as opposed to I could find a way to like this. And so usually I try and find a way to like something. And so I, I end up liking most everything I try. Um, but things particularly... Don't you have um, like some chisels you don't really like? The Harbor Freight hand plane, um, I bought one of those right off the bat, and every now and then I pull it out and I tune it up and I make the thing perfect, and I'm like, yes, I'm going to try this thing, because I love to put out a video saying, you can make the Harbor Freight hand plane work, and every time I do that, it just doesn't work. <laughs> it's, it's a piece of junk. Um, and I have one, uh, I have a, a cobalt hand plane, which I've had a few people who say they like the cobalt hand plane. And every now and then I pull that out and I try and make it work and it just doesn't. Um, anything made by Irwin in the last 30 years, um, just, I, yeah, I haven't gotten my way into that. Um, I think those, those are the big things. Is any of the, the newer companies that try to make cheap quality stuff that they sell in the big box store, just, it's, it's not worth it. Um, yeah. Impulse hardened teeth on saws. I hate impulse hardened teeth. Yes, they may stay sharp longer, um, but then once they're, once they go dull, then they're, they're worthless. And I, but what do you expect? It's a $5 saw. Go buy another one. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that's about it. Any other questions? Oh, there's lots of questions. Well, I mean, is there anything that I'm, I'm missing? Ugh. We might uh, do the Q&As a little more often, but uh, I think next time we're going to be doing a raised I, panel okay. door. So here would be my suggestion if we're going to do another Q&A, is that you ask for questions ahead of time. Well, what I really want to do is have a forum where people can post questions and then vote on them. Or something um, like that, yeah. Um, and that way people can vote their question to the top of the list. And Google Hangouts used to have an option for that, and then they dropped it. And I'd love to see it come back into YouTube Live, but it hasn't yet. So, yeah. Cool. Well, I think that's about it. Anything for game? Sweet. So, well, in ne until next time, um, I guess about it. <laughs> Send James an email if you didn't get to your question. I'll try and answer all those. I think that'll do it. Until next time, have a wonderful day.